Hello, this is Vitualis the Chess Noob, learning and having fun with chess. Recently, I watched a video of a version of the Vienna Gambit in the Max Lang defense line of the Vienna game. Shout out to Chess Bootcamp, link in the description. Today, I gave it a go. Please enjoy. So this was a relatively short game, uh, 20 moves. So uh, let's have a quick look at the review. Not a super accurate game for either myself or the opponent. You know, we are in this fairly short game, we've both made some blunders, but you know, made some pretty good moves as well. And when we look at this chart, one of the really interesting things here is just like um, uh, sort of some of my videos on sort of undeserved, uh, undeserved wins, is that I win with a, what is apparently a blunder. I win with a blunder. Uh, however, we will see this, uh, this blunder in context, because I think that was actually a pretty good move. Let's now look at the analysis. So, <clears throat> the end of game, e4, e5, knight c3. Okay, and a max lang defense is when the opponent plays knight c6 in a symmetrical manner. And previously what I would do would be to develop the bishop to c4, <clears throat> and I think that is in fact the best move. Uh, but I, I never entirely liked the Max Lang defense because very often what would happen, uh, let's just show, uh, let's say bishop goes to c4, opponent now develops the other knight, um, and then in fact in this position the best position, uh, the best move for white is um, is develop their other knight and you basically end up with the four knights game um, or something that looks like the Italian. Uh, commonly I wouldn't want to do that because I want to still want to play the, the Vienna so I would uh, develop uh, develop a pawn, they might develop a pawn uh, and then you know and then I might push and then you end up in sort of uh, yeah what they call the bishops opening Berlin Vienna hybrid. Still a fairly positional game, um, not necessarily that great for white. Uh, not the sort of Vienna I like to play anyway. So I was really uh, interested to see um, that in this position f4, so the Vienna Gambit, is in fact playable. Uh, and previously I had thought that it wasn't playable, that you know that the opponent would just straight up capture a pawn, you would lose a pawn. But the potential here is um, is that uh, is if they don't, uh, don't uh, immediately take the uh, take the gambit, uh, let's say they develop their other knight, in this position you can capture, uh, they might capture back, uh, push, and basically you transpose uh, back to um, to the Vienna gambit, the very nice line in the Vienna gambit. And you know this knight now has some serious troubles because he can't go anywhere, uh, and this is a great position, uh, something that uh, you can get back into sort of the, the more ordinary Vienna gambit um, through this transposition. And that was what I was hoping for uh, anyway. Um, now in this game, uh, the opponent did in fact accept the gambit, which is fine I suppose, uh, and here the best move would be to play knight f3, um, of course, to watch out for that check. And that defends that check. The opponent now played bishop e7. And I didn't recognize the potential threat that bishop e7 actually uh, represented. Uh, and I wasn't sure what was the best move. As I am denied, I couldn't see a reason not to play uh, play the pawn move to d4, take the center, so that's what I did. Now Stockfish says bishop c4 is best here. And the reason for that uh, will become sort of um, will become obvious uh, because that's what uh, what happened to me. But basically, it's because the the queen and the bishop are now on the dark square diagonal uh, with the Vienna gambit, uh, just like with the king's gambit. The dark square diagonal with the king is weak, and two attackers, only one defender, uh, I'll end up losing a piece. And if the bishop had already moved, then when the bishop comes with check, there's an opportunity of moving the king out of the way. And in fact, this is one of the uh, learnings I, I got out of analysis uh, in this particular system, in this particular line, is to be willing to move the king uh, and give up the right to castle. It's a bit counterintuitive, uh, counterintuitive, but it's actually potentially quite, quite good. 
Now opponent plays a bishop move, bishop h4 with check. Here I push the pawn. Um, of course they uh, they capture back with pawn. I capture back with my pawn. They capture back and you know I've lost now uh, all my pawns on the king side and the king is forced to move anyway. So if the bishop had moved earlier, the king could have moved without Lou having made some of those trades in pawns. Opponent plays knight h6, uh, which was apparently a bad move. I <laughs> go back to equality, but it's a bit obscure. Um, I now play d5 to threaten the, the knight. Apparently that was a bad move, though I would say some of the potential follow-up moves are a little bit on the maybe the obscure side in terms of why it's so bad. Um, no, that made sense. Captures, they capture back with the bishop. So basically for me, my goal was trying to evacuate some of the attackers on the king's side because the king's quite exposed on this side. Uh, and then given I've lost these pawns, maybe trying to move sort of my attackers into making an attack on the opponent's king side, given that effectively losing the pawns can be used as a opportunity because these are now semi-open files. I, so, bring my queen out. Um, that of course pins that uh, pins that uh, pawn uh, attack uh, on uh, both the knight and their bishop. Um, at the moment of course I can't take that knight, that wouldn't make any sense, just like I can't take that pawn, but I thought that was potentially good. Um, but bringing, bringing my queen to that position. The opponent sort of opens up their diagonal with uh, d6, um, also putting a defender on that bishop, so that makes sense. Uh, and I thought here, however, I have an opportunity to actually just whack that bishop, take it out of uh, take it out of the picture, and that's what I did, and allows me to also develop my rook. Now Stockfish didn't like the, uh, these moves, however, it doesn't make it much worse, and I thought this potentially simplified uh, some of my uh, some some of my um, some of my uh, attacks. Uh, they play queen f6, which uh, I was pretty sure was not a good move because now I've got rook f3 attack uh, that's defended by the by my queen. So their queen is now forced to do something, forced to make a move, uh, and they uh, and they do. So queen out and back in. Uh, that's not a great position for the queen, I suppose. So effectively, I won a little bit of tempo. Next, I need to open up this diagonal because I thought if I could just whack that knight or if I could bring the bishop here, that uh, that um, no, makes that square, uh, no, I'm attacking that square potentially really, really well. So king now forward, uh, king d3, very gratified in the analysis. See, that was the best move. So in this system, the king is part of the, part of the forces. Um, the opponent sees this, so undevelops their knight to g8, which was in fact the best move. However, I decided to continue with my attack bishop g5, forcing that bishop to move out, I capture, they capture back, and at this point obviously I've got to do something about my queen because it's under attack. And I was thinking of one of two positions, so either g5 or h4. Now eventually I ended up going with h4, and almost immediately after the move I started sort of doubting myself and thinking, no, maybe, maybe g5 was best, and Stockfish reckons g5 is best. And part of the, my reason here was that I thought, oh look, you know, if the knight captures the pawn here, you know, they, they're potentially attacking the queen here again, but of course that doesn't really make a lot of sense, um, uh, because you now I'll just be capturing the queen and then I'll be able to take the, uh, take the knight back afterwards, they're just trading a knight for a pawn. It's, fine, it's good. Um, and the main advantage with having the queen on g5 is that it attacks the pawn on g7. Uh, and in fact, it, I think it's actually fairly difficult for the opponent to really defend that pawn. Uh, they now make a blunder. Uh, and as and you'll see, sort of minus, almost minus two. Uh, and basically, um, from a conceptual perspective, it's a blunder because, you know, that that rook is about to join join the game. That could go in any of these squares. And now, uh, with no pawns here, these are all semi-open files, and I've got you know, pretty strong attack on the king's side. It would have probably made much more sense for the king to go the other side. I now play rook a f1. And what's really interesting is Stockfish hates this move. So minus six. So the best move for me, reckon, it reckons, was rook h, uh, was rook h1. Uh, you know, you can see how that makes sense because, you know, there's a potential uh, mating attack there. So with this rook, if I just whack that rook, that could potentially would be mate. Um, but, you know, I, I, I thought that this was potentially something that was not difficult for the opponent to defend against. Like I could see how they could defend against it. So I assume my opponent could see 
see as well. Um, but you know, why is this apparently so bad? Now the reason it's bad is that the, uh, the opponent has to find one move, which is knight captures pawn on d5, uh, and that allows a defense of the queen, and the queens face each other. But they had to find that move, and I don't think that was the most obvious uh, move to find, because you know, you would sort of note that moving the knight means that uh, you know, the queens are looking at each other, that there is a potential, you know, a potential queen trade. Um, and here with these two pieces, you know, this is a three-way attack. Let's just get rid of this arrow. It's a sort of a three-way attack on the knight. So captures, if they capture back, you know, it, it just looks strong. It just looks really strong. And in fact, it is really strong. If we look at the lines, if the opponent didn't see the best move, now there's some discrepancies here because these numbers are at a much higher uh, stockfish depth, so depth 30. I think here it's only up to depth 18. But basically it ends up being the same. So this is their only good move. And if they don't see that move, if they don't make the move, the second and third best moves actually seeds a massive advantage to white. And uh, and and if the uh, if the rook actually went to uh, went to h1, you don't see that. The opponent has a number of good moves that they can make. Here, they've got one good move. Otherwise, everything else is bad. Uh, and as we shall see, they sort of thought for about 40 seconds, uh, and then they basically, in my view, make a blunder. They play knight d7, uh, and uh, you know basically hang their queen. So queen captures queen. I think the opponent probably slapped their forehead. Oh, what did I do? Uh, and they opted to resign in this position. Good game, GG. Two takeaways from this game. One, there's some theory to learn in this line of the opening. And two, don't castle into an opponent's attack. I hope you found this video interesting, and thanks for watching.